North Carolina gets another crack at Virginia, and great news. This time, Armando Baycott and Pete Nance should both be available. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, February 24th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked on Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. Let's dive right into this thing. North Carolina hosting Virginia on Saturday. Let me first off remind us of the mindset necessary for Carolina from here on out. Survive and advance. Started putting this out there last Friday, um, and, and it's what Carolina has to do one game at a time. North Carolina took care of business on the road at Notre Dame on Wednesday, but now comes this much bigger test, albeit against a team Carolina could have already beaten last time out and so this is this is the way forward one game at a time one half at a time one four minute chunk of play between media timeouts at a time one play at a time executing exactly as you are supposed to because remember last time this this game happened in charlottesville earlier this year Carolina led that matchup by as many as nine in the first half. And as I alluded to off the top, that's without Pete Nance. That's without Armando Baycott, who hurt his ankle, you know, just a little bit into the game. But Virginia responded, built a 10-point second half lead, and was able to hold on for a seven-point victory. Now, for the Cavs, they do only have five losses this season. They lost to, home, to Houston at home, understandable number one team in the nation. They lost at Miami, at Pitt, the two teams they are contending with atop the ACC right now. And they lost at Virginia Tech. You don't want to do that this year, but Virginia Tech is better than their record shows. But the head scratcher is their most recent game where they lost at Boston College. And... Unfortunately for Carolina, they're going to be facing a Virginia team coming off of that loss. And so, you know, Tony Tony Bennett's team is going to be upset. But here's the weird thing for me about Virginia right now. You might look at that and think, oh, that's a weird one-off, but it wasn't. Their last three games, Virginia only beat Louisville by three, only beat Notre Dame by two, and then they lost at BC. So they're not setting the world on fire right now. That's that's struggle to win or losing against three of the worst teams in the conference. <laughs> so Virginia is still right at the top of the ACC, currently a half game behind Miami and tied with Pitt. But they are clearly vulnerable. As we saw the first time the Tar Heels played them, this is a beatable team. Carolina can absolutely beat them. Let me give you three reasons why I think that is possible. Number one, when you think of Virginia, what do you think of? Aside from falling asleep because of how boring it is. Defense. You think of elite defensive teams that stop you and stop you and stop you and dictate pace and all of that. Now, the the pace dictation, that ain't changing. But while this version of the Cavs, the 2022-23 Cavs are a good defensive team. They are not elite like some of those teams we've seen in recent years. So many of those have been, for example, top five at Ken Palm in defensive efficiency. This team currently, at the time of this recording, is 27th in the nation in defic- defensive efficiency. Now, clearly that's not bad. That's great. There are 363 Division I teams, and they're 27th in it. But it's it's not to the level that we have seen uh, more often than not from the team out of Charlottesville. So while this is a good defensive team, it's not elite. Another reason I think Carolina can absolutely beat them is this is not one of those Virginia teams that in addition to all their scrappy defensive, slow it down, we're all bought in kind of guys. Some of those best teams also have 
just a dude, uh, like a, a clearly NBA player who comes alongside of all that and makes it happen offensively. Somebody like DeAndre Hunter or Malcolm Brogdon, who just went off on Thursday night in the NBA. Virginia doesn't really have that. They've got some talented guys, but they don't have that dude, right? The dude that scares you or that you're like, he could go off at any moment. Again, they've got dudes, but not the dude. So I think they're beatable. And number three, Carolina, on the other hand, has those athletes to go out and offset Virginia's pack line, to offset what they're trying to do to disrupt you. Carolina has the guys to, to frustrate that defense, but they got to do it. Now, on the other hand, at the same time, while I say Virginia is very beatable, there are clearly reasons for concern. We know a ton of them just based on what Carolina has done this year. But let me let me just give you a couple things. Notre Dame, not setting the world on fire defensively by any stretch of the imagination. I talked about Virginia being 27th in the nation in def- defensive efficiency. Notre Dame is 275th <laughs> in defensive efficiency. That's at Ken Palm. That team, that team that's 275th in defensive efficiency held Carolina to 19 first half points the other night there in South Bend. They also held them to a season low in field goal percentage and a season low in three point field goal percentage. Now, you recall Carolina won that game. So I'm not saying that's not overcomable. However, if that team stopped Carolina that well, what's Virginia going to do? Carolina's got to get better offensively. And then when you think back to the Roy Williams era Tar Heels, they really struggled against the uh, against the Cavaliers in the Tony Bennett era. A lot of that is because um, that pack line can do a great job of disrupting um, interior play. And that's what Carolina Roy Williams teams were built on, right? Two bigs operating together well, high, low, pass, block to block, whatever it may be. And uh, that that Virginia defense can thwart that pretty easily. (laughs) Then comes Hubert Davis last year, and you've got this team that's like, hey, we're going to do the opposite of that, and we're going to spread out, and we're going to bomb you to death from three. And that was extremely effective against Virginia last year. And you might recall that Carolina won both times they played the Cavs last year. But here's the problem. This is not last year's Hubert Davis team. That team shot very well. This team, as you know, is uh, flirting with being the worst three-point shooting team in Carolina history, (laughs) to put it in those terms. This year's team has to operate more like a Roy Williams team, which allows teams, as you've seen over and over again, to pack the paint, to sag down on Mondo. You think Virginia is not going to take advantage of that? Absolutely they are and are going to dare Carolina to hit from outside. So what's that I smell? I smell trouble for the Tar Heels unless they can either have an atypical shooting night, meaning a bunch of them are going in or find some other wrinkles like that high low they used to good effect on Wednesday night at Notre Dame. So that's kind of where things are at. I think this Virginia team is very beatable. They've proven that in their games lately, and Carolina has proven that they can play with them. But Carolina has also proven that they can struggle with about anybody this season. That's just the grim reality of both sides of that. So is this game winnable? Absolutely it is. Is this game losable? Absolutely it is. We're going to have to find out how Carolina is going to be able to go and do the good side of that. So in just a second, I want to give you my what to watch for my W2, W4 for this game. And we will do that. But first, let me tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. We're at the midway point of the NBA season. In fact, it just tipped back off on Thursday night after the All-Star break. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, it's secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and three-pointers drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a same-game parlay. 
So don't miss your opportunity to get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. Once again, that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Oh man, thank you for checking out Locked on Tar Heels. I want to ask you next to check out Locked on College Basketball, our brand new national college basketball show here on the Locked on Network. You can find it on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. All right, here is your uh, what to watch for, and I've actually got a what to watch five in this one. I know I usually give you four things, but I'm going to slide in a fifth one for this game. Now, number one, we already said this, but I want to look at it a little bit more. Remember the first time around, Pete Nance missed that game. Armando Baycott went down 79 seconds into it, twisting his ankle, having that that big issue, and that meant Carolina's front court was gone. Will Shaver's already out for the season at that point, and so Jalen Washington, who's just getting back into playing shape at that point, winds up playing 26-plus minutes and, and does fine, but clearly got gassed down the stretch. So the question, Carolina, who lost that game by seven points, can they be eight points better with Leaky, excuse me, not Leaky, with Armando and Pete Nance both back in the fold? You certainly hope so. Now, obviously, it brings about different dynamics. I think part of the reason Carolina was able to get that nine point first half lead against Virginia last time is you've planned to play a certain way against a team that's got. Armando Baycott in the middle, and he's not there. And so that upsets things, and, and Carolina is able to take advantage of that, perhaps. Perhaps not, but I, I think that at least played something of a factor in Carolina building a lead before G- Virginia got their, their heads wrapped around what was going on, and then they they figured things out in the second half. But another part of that is it also means that there's really not too much you can take away from what happened in that first game in Charlottesville, because this is going to be a completely different game. Carolina with Armando Baycott and or Pete Nance on the floor is wildly different from Carolina with only Jalen Washington and neither of them. Although I I didn't talk about this after the Notre Dame game, we did have some some moments in the Notre Dame game where Jalen Washington was the only big on the floor. No Pete Nance, no Armando Baycott. They were both on the bench. Interesting enough. Uh, It wasn't very long, but it did happen. So how does the return of those two players affect this game? I think it will have a big effect. So watch for that. What to watch for? Point number two, patience. You have to remember that against Virginia, it is so much easier to slow a game down than speed it up. Now, thankfully for Carolina, uh, another reason the Roy Williams era teams struggled with Virginia is because they couldn't play at that pace they wanted to play at. The Hubert Davis Tar Heels do not play at that pace. We know that. And so they're actually probably a, a, another part of why Hubert Davis's team last year succeeded is because they're more comfortable playing at a slower rate. But here's the thing. Virginia has zero problem defending you for the entirety of the shot clock, not, not getting out of rhythm or alignment or spacing. They will do what they need to do, and they will f- kind of try to goad you into taking shots that you shouldn't take. Armando Baycott is not going to be allowed to beat Virginia tomorrow on Saturday. I'm just telling you. They're going to want to goad Leaky Black, to goad Puff Johnson and others into taking more threes. Pete Nance, until they prove they can hit it, it's like, have fun. Knock yourselves out. We're just going to hang out and hear Garden Mondo. See what you can do, right? Like Carolina cannot be tricked into taking those shots. They have to work to get from good to better to best shots. That's the goal. So my word for the Carolina offense is patience. That's number two in what to watch for. Number three in what to watch for. Let's go to the other side of the court when Carolina's on defense. You might recall, and and we've talked about this here on the show, that last year, Coach Davis put who? Leaky Black on Kihei Clark, the diminutive point guard for Virginia. And it cut the head off the snake, and uh, an already bad offensive team was made worse by that. Now, in the first game this season, I think it it's hard to know because Pete Nance was already out going into the game. There's only, I believe, just one, maybe two offensive possessions before Armando went out. But Leakey was not guarding Kihei Clark. He was on Jaden Gardner. Now, the question becomes, if both Pete and Armando had been in the game, 
um, would Coach Davis have had Leakey on key as he did last year, which clearly worked to great effect because not only was Carolina – uh, did they do a good job offensively, but they were able to shut down Virginia all the more so defensively because of having that length and height on Kihei Clark. So um, is, is it worth exploring that again? I think perhaps so, right? As we've talked about at this point in the season, throw caution to the wind and just try stuff. Cause at this point you're on the outside looking on looking in and what you've been doing hasn't been working. So let's try it. Why not? I'd love to see uh, a, a go back to last year when Leakey was guarding Kihei Clark. Might not go well. Great. You switch defensive assignments and move on. But it's worth uh, seeing what that looks like. Number four in our what to watch for. I came up with this phrase as I was thinking about this game. I want. I, at first I was thinking, hey, I want to see Carolina play a desperate basketball game. But I didn't like that. I, I thought, Isaac, yes, Isaac. I don't like that. Okay, let's come up with something new. And here's why. Because desperation often leads to rush or hurry. And we just talked about patience is a word we're looking for. And so I want to see Carolina not just be desperate because that leads to too fast. That leads to mental mistakes and other things. Here's the phrase I'm putting on it. I want to see controlled desperation. And by that, I mean, I want Carolina to realize the gravity of the game they're in and the weight that this carries of the necessity to win it. Now, as we've said, the, the magic number here is five. Carolina's already got one of those against Notre Dame. You're looking to sweep the rest of the regular season, if at all possible, so that that's less you have to do in the ACC tournament. Um, and so that's the desperation. You, you need this game, but it's got to be under control. It's got to be within Carolina principles. It's got to be within the flow of the offense and the defense and what this team is looking for. But you got to have that sense of urgency and desperation while under control. So the phrase for me is I want to see controlled desperation. And then fifth in the what to watch for is that high-low attack that Carolina utilized well against Notre Dame. It was almost like the way you attack uh, Syracuse's zone out of the high post. Pete Nance operated on multiple occasions out of that high post. Carolina got some back screen action and other things. Uh, there were plays where no defense dropped back to the baseline behind Mondo. He was able to cre create some space carved out for himself. And Pete Nance just has great touch over the top. That's a way to beat Virginia's pack line. Go up over the top of it inside. If you can do that, and, and Pete Nance clearly can. Remember, he led the team with five assists on Wednesday night. And so that's something to watch for. Can, can well, it, And maybe the high-low, Virginia sniffs it out and you can't do it. But what are those kind of wrinkles that we haven't seen schematically that Carolina could employ to, to offset what Virginia is trying to do? I would love to see more of that. And then counters to the counters as Virginia attacks it. So those are five things I am watching for in this game. Want to get then to the women who had senior night on Thursday night as they hosted number seven, Virginia Tech. And unfortunately, it was senior night heartbreak, heartbreak for these ladies. We'll talk about that and we'll have our heels of the week and a quick tour around what's happening around Carolina athletics this weekend. And we'll do that in just a second. Okay, senior night heartbreak for Courtney Banghart's team Carolina loses 61 to 59 at home to Virginia Tech on a buzzer beater from who is now the all-time leading scorer in Virginia Tech history. Man, and and the unfortunate thing of it is Carolina has played two great games against Virginia Tech. They almost beat them on New Year's Day in Blacksburg, fell by 3 in that one, fell by 2 last night uh in the in Carmichael. And so five total points they have lost to Virginia Tech by. This was a tough game, a gritty game, but Carolina fell just shy. And so to unpack it some, I want to give you the four corners recap to this game, starting with number one that I thought was the biggest and most important thing that happened for the Tar Heels. And that was that Eva Hodgson and Alyssa Utsby were back in the lineup for senior night. Now, obviously, uh, Hodgson a senior, Utsby a junior, and so you're going to get her back next year. But um, I just thought it was critically important that they're able to work them back in before the postseason. And so to be able to get both these ladies back in the lineup, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with two games to go in the regular season, hopefully they're both able to play again on Sunday against Duke. 
uh, but but you are encouraged by that. Now, that said, um, while they contributed things, neither uh, neither Eva nor Alyssa was efficient in their shooting. They're both, um, you know, going to just take time, right? Get back into, into the flow of things, get, find their form again. They were just both off a bit. Utsby was missing bunnies at the, at the rim, missed some free throws that you would normally expect her to make. Um, but they both did make impactful plays and that's, you're just reminded of what they can do. They just unfortunately weren't able to do it as consistently on Thursday night as they are. But the, the two combined to score six of Carolina's first 12 um, and us be getting back, showing why Carolina misses her so much in the rebounding game. She had four offensive rebounds in this one. And so really encouraged by that. And hopefully they can take yet another step forward on Sunday against Duke. Number two in the four corners recap, Deja Kelly did everything in this game. And by that, I mean everything. She played the entire 40 minutes of this game, scored 18 points of nine of 19 shooting, had four rebounds, six assists. So it's not just that she's dropping the ball in the bucket. She's getting the ball to her teammates. And that's uh, what Coach Banghart needs from Deja Kelly game in and game out. Along with that, two steals. And then, remember, she played 40 minutes, just one turnover uh, compared against those six assists. Great stuff from Deja. Not only that, but she's she's doing it in crunch time. Carolina needed buckets as, as the teams were trading the lead back and forth down the stretch. And Deja got two of them back to back kind of mid ranges. The last one, boy, it just danced around the, on the rim a little bit before it fell through to give Carolina lead with 12 seconds left. And I mean, both teams were able to score more and more. Cause remember in the women's game, you can call a timeout to advance the ball. Like in the NBA guys can't do that. And so um, each team was able to score um, more even after that, but, um, unfortunately, Carolina just couldn't couldn't do it, and I, I know um, they're going to be sick about that for sure. Number three on our Four Corners recap, going back to us and Hodgson being back in, one of the great things about that is it just gives Carolina that much more depth on on a basketball team where the the bench just isn't as deep as like a football team, for example just getting one player, much less two back is critically important. And so you think about how this moves the likes of Kayla McPherson out of the starting lineup or Paulina Paris out of the starting lineup as, the, as they both had experience with that in the last couple of weeks allows them to go to the bench, which is what they were intended and expected to do and then come in to the game and affect it in other ways. And it's not just those two ladies, but man, they're just both so important to what Carolina can do. Paulina Paris hit multiple big threes um like she hit uh, Paulina hit one to put Carolina back in front in the final two minutes um of, of the first half there um and then there Carolina had this big drought in the third quarter and the two of them McPherson and Paris teamed up um to end that Paris ended it with uh the drought with a three-pointer to bring Carolina within one and um then Kayla got a steal and was fouled in transition, hit both free throws to give Carolina a, a one-point lead, 41-40 at that point with um, a minute 45 left in the third quarter. And then they just kept doing things. Even, even in the fourth quarter, Kayla, like with under two minutes left, Carolina's down four, and you're like, man, you got to score here. And they get into a late shot clock situation. Bing, bang, boom. She hits a three coming off the baseline, all the way back up to the wing, hits it, and Carolina is still in the game. And so even though Carolina doesn't win it, you see some positive signs in terms of plays made, and you see some positive signs in terms of depth and what that's going to allow. Now, is Kayla McPherson still going too fast at times? Yes. Is she going to figure out how to shift gears? Yes. But you love uh, the, the energy, you love the passion you see out of her, and you want to find ways to keep that going. And then the fourth point of the four corners recap is Carolina's defense at times can be suffocating. They held Virginia Tech to just nine points in the first quarter, which is a season low for the Hokies in the first quarter. And so if, if Carolina could extend that, because that was the issue, is they built this great lead, had a 10-point lead, and 
Virginia Tech, man, they just can get unhinged and start going, and we're just burying threes. And got back in the game, took the lead, and ultimately, um, after trading buckets, won the game at the buzzer. And so um, Carolina did what they needed to do out of the gate, but we just weren't able to sustain it as long as they needed to to get the win. Well, as we said, the Tar Heels round out the regular season on Sunday at Duke noon Eastern. Make sure you check that out. Maybe try to squirm your way into to the game. Well, next we move to our heels of the week, our good and our bad, the heel of the week and the heel of the week. For the good, it's kind of a group heel of the week, and that is all the coaches, the head coaches and assistant coaches at North Carolina. And here's why. At a time, and you'll hear more about this in the other heel of the week, at a time where so many coaches are under scrutiny for bad decisions they've made like in off the court moments or, or things that have been left unsaid that have become very public lately. I am thankful to be able to cover this school and its teams and its coaches whom you don't have to worry about that with. Now, I don't know all of them personally or intimately or anything like that, but that just Everything you know about them, everything you hear about them is that they are upstanding, moral, ethical people whom you would want leading your own son or daughter on their team. And I'm very grateful for that. You don't worry about them. You trust them. You know that they will do the the correct thing, the moral thing for the team and the players. And I am so grateful for that. But that leads us to our heel of the week. And that is the Alabama basketball program and the way they've handled this whole thing with one of the best players in the entire nation, Brandon Miller. Now, if you haven't heard, I'm assuming most of you have heard this week that more information came out about the shooting that happened back in January that unfortunately killed a 23 year old mother who has a five year old son who will now grow up without his mother. Brandon Miller did not do that. He, you know, was not the one to shoot or anything, but it turns out that the gun that did kill her was in his car and uh, his friend who had it texted him to ask him to bring the gun to where they were. Now the, the reports that have come out are like, yeah, but he didn't know what he was going to use that gun for. And these kind of things. It's one 45 in the morning. If someone asks you to bring them their gun. And so I just, it's, it's a bad mistake by a young man in college. We've all made mistakes of varying degrees of, of silliness. Um, this one, unfortunately, led very quickly to the death of a young mother. But I take it to the coaches as well, because Coach Nate Oates knew of this and has done nothing to punish or suspend Brandon Miller, at least publicly. And while legally, Miller has been cleared of any charges. Great, fine, accept that. My my issue is the ethics or the morals of it. And I, I want to separate the morality from the legality. Because morally and ethically, what is it teaching these young men if, if they're making these decisions? And I get it. Poor decisions. You hate that. You don't want to make poor decisions. And we all make them. But we have to be held culpable for the bad decisions that we make. And in this case... Brandon Miller wasn't. And I'm not here suggesting that it's because he's one of the best players in America. I'll leave that for other people to talk about. I just want to talk about how adults handle these moments. And while there's nothing legally that Miller's been charged with, in a basketball program where we're trying to train, specifically in this case, young men to to grow up and and be fathers and husbands and contributing members of society, what does it tell them if we don't hold them responsible for the poor decisions they make? I think we have to do better. And so again, that goes back to why I'm so thankful for the coaches, because I know that Hubert Davis, if somebody on his team had done that, that young man would have missed basketball for some amount of time. I don't doubt that for a second, but We got to do better. All right, let's go on a quick weekend preview around Carolina athletics because there's some great stuff happening as always. Man, as we get into the spring, there's always something. I'm going to run through this 
quickly. Baseball is at East Carolina Friday through Sunday. Softball is down in Boca Raton. Nice sleepy retirement action going on there. The Joan Joyce Classic. Women's tennis in action in Virginia against Virginia and Virginia Tech. They'll take on both of those teams in Charlottesville and Blacksburg this weekend. Men's tennis is hosting Boston College. Track is uh, at the ACC Indoor Championships, women's lacrosse on Friday at Virginia Tech, men's lacrosse Saturday at Syracuse Gymnastics is taking on Temple. Fencing is in the ACC Championships, and men's golf is in action in Las Vegas. Holy smokes, all sorts of Tar Heels galore, great stuff there. So make sure you check in on all these great teams and everything they are doing this weekend. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. That's it for this week of Locked on Tar Heels. Thanks so much for joining me all week long. Make sure you go back and listen to the other shows if you didn't have an opportunity to. We will talk again on Monday following the game against Virginia and all the other action that happened this weekend. Get you caught up and prepared for the week ahead. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. Make sure you email the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Love having conversations with you guys and loving all the emails that keep coming in. Please don't forget to subscribe to the show. We are just a 100 YouTube subscribers shy of 5,000. Would love for you to be one of those. Also, smash the like button and leave comments on our conversation today. And for your next listen, check out the brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball, hosted by myself and Andy Patton, bringing you everything you need to know about the world of college basketball five days a week, just like this show. You can find it on YouTube and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with me today on Friday. I want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until next week. Peace.